This long arm of the river, this meandering Truson, has taken us to another odd curiosity. Borneo streams and rivers, salt marshes, inland extensions of the sea, and brackish estuaries are spawning grounds for strange freaks of natural life, like oysters growing on trees. The natives collect the shellfish as if gathering fruit by lopping off limbs clustered with oysters. They don't actually grow on the trees. With the rise and fall of flood water and tide, branches are submerged at high water and the bivalves cling to them, just as they might to a sunken rock. When the water recedes, they are left high and dry out on the limb. They don't spoil, they live and flourish. Nature has adapted these oysters to a tree-growing life. Is that right, Professor Lou Lair? Yes, sir. I never hear of trees and oysters being so attached to each other. But that proves nothing. Lots of things you don't like at first, but they grow on you. <laughs> I have spoken. Well, on the half shell, they're about the same as an American oyster, only a bit larger and just as tasty. In Borneo, they gather their seafood courses from trees. That's very plausible. But this is the first time I ever see an oyster with a handle on it. I thank you. Via the winding rivers, we can explore the oddest corners of Borneo by boat. So now we're on an excursion to another madcap phenomenon of this island of the incomprehensible. Through the unending jungle, the tropical forest that chokes this equatorial land, on to more Borneo madness, vast caves that provide the heights of luxury for a Chinaman's banquet, stupendous grottoes that yield treasures for celestial feasting. Sounds fantastic, but it's Borneo. <laughs> That yawning entrance is 200 feet high. Inside, the ceiling of the cave rises to 400 feet. From the blackness within, the outside world makes a picture of dazzling brilliance. The limestone grotto is so stupendous that this is virtually a hollow mountain. What lives within the eternal black? Birds, millions of birds. They're swift and certainly deserve the name. Streaks of speed, those clouds of innumerable swift. There's a hawk preying on the swift. Predatory birds find a bounteous hunting field here. Mankind preys on the nests of the swift. These tiny birds are the benefactors of the Chinaman and his bird's nest suit. Bats inhabit the cave by day, the feathered home builders by night, a colony of millions. The swifts build their homes in the sightless black of the cavern, and there the nests are gathered by the natives. The bird's nest hunters plunder the cave twice a year. The caravan carries its loot to a government post. The trade in nests from the caves of the Swift is strictly regulated by the government, the second largest industry in Borneo. The take of a semi-annual expedition like this may be valued as high as $100,000. The government claims half, and the hunters get half. An inspector grades the nests for quality, and that provokes many a loud Borneo argument. <laughs> The birds cement their nests with a kind of mucus saliva. That's the essence, the prime ingredient for the Chinaman soup. White nests are best, no feathers in them. They have sold as high as $30 a pound. The blacker the nest, more feathers, the poorer the grade, selling as low as 60 cents a pound. 
Plundered from Borneo birds, these are Epicurean tidbits for the banquets of distant China. Back where they left the raft, and the expedition pushes on, but not to any mere freak of nature this time. This next leg of the journey takes them to the headhunters. grow swift. They have to pole the boat, push them along by thrusting against the bottom, fighting the current. Push them up, Borneo boy, and sometimes it's overboard. comes a cataract. It's hard going for the boatmen. They can make scarcely any progress. Every ounce of strength is needed to drive an inch forward. And sometimes they don't go forward at all, but are swept backward. Too much current, too much swirl. They can't get ahead. Can't even get ahead in the land of the headhunters. this land has been the gruesome pursuit of human heads. That's what gave the island its reputation for ferocity and created the legend of the wild man of Borneo. British and Dutch authorities have labored to stamp out the dread practice in their territory, head hunting severely punished. But secretly that old custom of horror still survives in the remote jungle. Cases still come to light of the savages taking heads. Well, the Martin Johnsons have seen these parts before. Eighteen years ago, on their previous trip to Borneo, they visited the headhunters of these parts, the Tingara tribe. The Tingaras were of evil notoriety as cranium snatchers in the times gone by. Presumably, they've stopped the practice now, though you never can tell. At any rate, they don't rush out wild and bloodthirsty. The headhunters of Borneo always were known to be good-natured, peaceable, timorous, almost cowardly. Mild people, nice people, except for headhunting. And there he is, the chief. I see you remember, all right. I see you remember. Yeah, we're both bald-headed, aren't we? Well, 18 years and a long time ago. That's not. But what's this? Hey, Jagger! I don't want my head hanging in your house. Oh, no. Oh, Mr. Buggles. Lady, come on. Oh, Mr. Buggles. Oh, Mr. Buggles. You used to hunt them this night? Huh? Got plenty in your house? Back among old friends, so naturally there's a party, a borny old jamboree with drinking and singing. They chew tobacco, also the narcotic betel nut. That's what stains their mouths. 
The Borneo drinks are fiery rice wine and a knockout toddy made of palm juice. And when they drink, they sing. They look hardly fierce enough to be headhunters, but that hideous custom was not warlike ferocity. It was superstition, the fear of evil spirits, propitiating the supernatural. They worked themselves up to a headhunting frenzy by superstitious rites, traditional chants, and the drinking of the palm toddy, like this. They celebrated for days, the palm toddy circulating too freely, and they were getting into a dangerous mood, it seemed, maybe a headhunting mood. They might break into some mad frenzy, and things were coming to a head. So while this continues, Osa has departed. She's gone downstream by boat to the base camp to return in the airplane and try and get the expedition out of this rather embarrassing situation. And here the giant bird comes winging. Pilot Jim Lanieri has practiced the art of landing on Borneo River. Risky flying fields, those winding, treacherous streams. Submerged floating logs are a peril out there. The Thunderbird makes the Tingaras go wild. They think it's the palm toddy, think they're seeing things. In all their weird legends of ghosts and witchcraft, there's nothing like this. The devil bird that sits on the water. The climax of the headhunter's celebration, the magic dragon, and the water is full of King Dara's as they swarm to the plain. <laughs> The rest of them coming out in canoes. Maybe it's time to be going. They might decide to take the head of the Thunderbird. We better take off. So goodbye, Tingal. They yell and shriek and fall overboard, taking a header. They fly downstream to the raft, which they left tied up in the river. There's the raft, and it looks like home, a relief after a case of jungle jitters. What next? Some new portentous episode? They're in for what seems like a mere gay interlude, and cannot guess that this will lead to the culminating jungle drama. Osa is taking it easy when visitors arrive, and she finds she can talk to them. Having been to Sandak and Bohari and Gila are vain of their knowledge of English. Pigeon. Mommy, ma'am, where Where you go? Why, you speak English. Yes, I speak English very much. Well, where do you learn English? Oh, I've been from Dhaka a long time. My father, he catch animals, and I go with him for to tell. And I learn to sing and dance, and I learn to talk English. All time, everybody. Where do you live? No long way. You want to come look see? Yes, sure. Where you live, up here? Yes. Long way? No long way. All right, come on, let's go. Sure, let's go. Come on, Logan.
So they paddle off to pay a Borneo social call, a prime opportunity to study native ways and customs. Science is interested in the human phenomena of this Isle of the Barbaric. In times past, the fierce name of Dayak was applied indiscriminately to the Borneo primitive. Now they're known to consist of many tribes of diverse racial antecedents, a puzzle problem for the anthropologist. Here, they're fraternally received by the Borneo collector of wild beasts and his retinue, as one animal man to another. Logan, the interpreter, is badly smitten with a malady as common in Borneo as in other places. Logan is a tribal cavalier, a Borneo troubadour. He can sing love songs and woo a maid proudly in pigeons. What do you want? I want nothing. I come look see you. Well, you look see now. Walk. Goodbye. Native life at its most characteristic, a study for the ethnologist, here where the Borneo animal man has his headquarters and where his daughters roll their own. It's native tobacco. The cigarette paper is the leaf of the nipa palm. The sociologist observes that women enjoy a modernistic degree of freedom on this island of paradox. They take a lively part in village life. Wild woman of Borneo. Somehow a fiddle has found its way to jungle town. Borneo music is barbaric, primitive heart. Or there are dreamy, lovely tunes, South Sea songs. This fiddling isn't exactly the dreamy, lovely kind. Ready for a festival in honor of the Martin Johnsons, a climax in this study of native customs and culture. They've invited other river tribes to come to the party. Now science can go deep into tropical anthropology, can make a profound analysis of Borneo ethnology. So let's have the scientific aspect propounded by that distinguished anthropologist and ethnologist, Professor Lou Lair. <laughs> uh, thank you. Borneo ethnology begins with the Malayan gamelan's music on legendary dance dry dry <laughs> She certainly does. Hey, Uncle Philip, where are you going? Oh, more ethnology. Slipping out for a little jug guzzling on a set liquid dynamite. They gotta pour water in it so it don't blow the jug apart. This is more habits than customs. Drinking up the party. <laughs> Anybody don't like that club life is crazy. <laughs> Forty old lovers never give up, but still she won't give over. Hey, fellas, somebody's coming here. Okay, resume inhaling. So this is Borneo, where the wild men come from. They're foolish for leaving. What a party. Come on, you shellac hounds, you're missing all the dancing. Wilbur, you better watch Uncle Philip. He gets too much play in the knee action. It's okay, boys, nobody misses you. If you don't breathe near a lighted match. Even with primitive people, the show looks great if you're full of schnapps. Wilbur, don't. He, he's had enough. Uh-uh, there they go again. Palsy Walsy. It's a shame they ain't headhunters, because they're going to have a couple of big ones in the morning. Go ahead, 
You lot, don't be bashful. You fellas is gonna get checked. Hey, look out, here is it. My, my, ain't there a lot of sky today? Okay, she's gone. When they are going soon, to wink at that jungle jump steady. Oop, they touch bottom. Look at them, fit as a fiddle and ready for wrestling elephants. Listen, Borneo hilly billies. Everybody dance for Martin and Otha, even little Ludwig. But where's the soap? Out in the jungle telling jokes. Don't stop them. Maybe you hear it before, but not in this language. <laughs> Wilbur, don't. You got Uncle Philip his story tickled. <laughs> Had a boy, Ludwig, swing it. Wilbur's got a million of them. So when the husband came home, <laughs> yes, sir, it was a great party. A good time was had by all. Wilbur and Uncle Philip went out like wet matches. Or never since, Uncle Philip is setting traps for the pink hippopotapuses he's seeing right now. A jungle giant has been spied. Long a terror of the village. They call it the devil be. One, the Uramutas pull one village. All men are afraid. One and men come, men are afraid. Well, what's the matter? These people here don't catch him. They're, they're, they're trappers. Who can shoot devil? Nobody can catch devil. Well, come on, let's like go. All right. Yeah, all right, boys, okay. We'll okay. Okay, now here. You go back there to camp, get Joe and Jim, Run. get all the boys. Run. And we'll go out and see what we can do. Now hurry up, hurry up now, quick. They're going to hunt the orangutan and they're going to do it the Borneo way, with a net. The monster anthropoid has repeatedly terrorized the village and defied the native hunters. Now, bucked up by the leadership of the white man, they are all nerved to track down the wild man of the forest. Native scouts have reported the orang to be in the deepest of the thicket. It will take all sorts of toil and cunning to bring the beast to bay and snare him in their net. And it may take days. Careful, Osa. A slip would be perilous in the face of the orang. The trail is hot. The orang is near. There. That's the first glimpse. The wild man of the forest. Look at him climb. The orang is more a creature of the treetops than his cousins, the chimpanzee and the gorilla. His home is at the roof of the jungle, and he sure knows how to get there. Up to the topmost branches. He swings up and up, 300 pounds of nimble orangutan. They see that he's a huge male, and that makes it pretty sure that we're in for a formidable battle, for the male orang is one of the fiercest fighters on earth. The Malays gave the species its name, orangutan, wild man of the forest. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. 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 How are they going to get him? 
He swings through the trees with the greatest of agility. Why can't he light out through the treetops and just keep on going? Why can't he make a beeline for some distant, more remote jungle? Perhaps his enormous weight keeps him from outdistancing his pursuers. Perhaps he hasn't enough sense of strategy for that. Or more logically, he just isn't afraid. High in his native jungle, he may be too contemptuous of the hunters to flee to the far distance. Anyway, he keeps out of their immediate reach, looking them over, wondering what they're up to. The strategy of this hunt is to maneuver him to a convenient tree where they can isolate him. The wild man of Borneo facing the peril of being trapped in an isolated tree. they've got him cornered this time. There's a wide space between the trees. He's been maneuvered to a place where apparently it's impossible for him to jump from one tree to another. Watch him. He seems puzzled. Can he make it? he tries a tremendous flying leap, but he's doubtful each time and pulls back. He made it! Magnificent! Old gloomy face is sure putting up a glorious struggle. The men are chopping down some more of the trees. Trying to isolate him, clearing away the tree so he can't escape, cutting an open space all around him, hoping it'll be too wide for any jungle leap. Look out, Mr. Orang. They're only taking your picture now, but there's worse to come. They're going to chop down the one you're perched in, and then what will you do? Down goes his tree. There he is. See him. Aha, he breaks away, crashes through the fallen foliage. They chase him with the net, hope to snare him, but they're not too anxious to get near him. Up a vine he goes. Up into another tree, the wild man of Borneo at large in his jungle again. And here's something that looks like a bold gesture, climbing up after him. Uh, don't worry, it's just a gesture. Dropping down still more trees. Got him isolated once more. And this time, they've actually cut off all chance of escape. He's a prisoner in his last treetop. Martin makes a camera study. It's a chance of a lifetime for him. Of the three great anthropoids, the orangutan is in some respects the most human. His face is savage and forbidding. Eyes close together, nose without any bridge. But he has 12 pairs of ribs like a human being, while the chimpanzee and gorilla have 13. Man like ape, infuriated wild man. Look out below, watch your head. He's ripping off branches, tossing them down. He realizes now he's trapped. No tree anywhere near that he can escape to. No way out, no wonder he rages. 
Mark and Osa grind out film. Pictures of the orang and his fury, ripping and tearing, stripping his treetop bare of branches. They tear away the jungle growth and clear an opening space of several acres around the train. Mr. Orang climbs higher and higher, but there's no way of escape in that direction. No escape into the sky. All he can do is climb as high as he can. <laughs> this time, they're not going to cut down the tree. The strategy is different. They've got him tree. They're going to keep him there. They're going to try and wait him out. They think that, well, perhaps he'll lose his patience and he'll dash down out of the tree. Dinner time as they keep their vigil. They're out to outstay the orang. Camping out, night coming on. They've got the tree so completely isolated that there can be no escape in the darkness. King of the forest, trapped at bay, a prisoner in his own realm. Wonder if he'll try to come down during the night and slip off. there when dawn breaks? He sure is. In fact, he's still asleep. How can they get him out of the tree? Well, they try something new this time, something strangely modern to startle Mr. Orang and drive him down, the airplane. That ought to frighten him to earth. Instead, he just sleeps on. The plane almost grazes him. Still he sleeps, or pretends to. The forest giant and the ultra-modern of the machine age. The plane again and again skims the treetop. But instead of being terrified, Mr. Orang merely growls his wrath. <laughs> Jungle defiance to civilization and the machine age. But what does he care? His jungle soul knows nothing about terror from the sky. And the plane stunt simply doesn't work. Now, let's try the native way, ropes and nooses. They've caught a brand. The old warrior of the jungle snarls and fights. He doesn't know what it is, but whatever it is, he doesn't want it. He doesn't know that they're trying to snare him in a loop of rope, trying to drag him down. And while they tug at the tough, wiry limb, he vents his fury on that rope. make more nooses, made with all the cunning of the Borneo hunter, snares of rope. But the orang hasn't figured it out. What does he know about slip knot? But he does know that it has something to do with his enemy, that it's a human trick, something to get him. Here's the battlefield. From the ground, to the highest treetop.
With their lassoes on poles, they try to catch his wrist in a loop. He simply doesn't realize the risk that he's taking as he fights back, trying to break the pole. They have the cunning, he the ferocity. Look out, old boy, you'll get your hand caught. Look out, that slip knot's going to drop around your wrist. And sure enough, it does. Now it's dragging down, but he still has the strength of many men. incredible fight he puts up. The last desperate defense of the wild man of Borneo. Notice how long are his hands and feet, and as powerful as steel, hanging on by his feet with a tremendous grip, matching his strength with the weight and power of a whole mob of men. Little does he dream that he's about to leave Borneo now, on his way to a far-off zoo. Training at the rope to his last ounce of strength, he feels only the tremendous desperation of the jungle wild as they drag him down. The wild man of Borneo playing the game out to his last gasp. And then, down he comes. Panting, worn out, half stunned. Around him they fling their nets, but even now there's fight left. He can still tear himself free. Vanquished at last. No, the incredible happened. Surely he can't get out of that, not even with all of his ponderous strength. But watch, watch that last burst of anthropoid power, and he's loose. That was glorious, just one final fling. But now, the jig is up. Winding, hanging, and prison in a net. Even now, the hunters hold him in great respect. You can see that by the way they tie him up with enough nets and ropes to bind up a whole tribe of men. And then, the dance of triumph. They vanquish their dread enemy, the dark menace to their village. The conquest of the wild man of the forest is a victory indeed for the jungle folk. Giant is right. There's a lot of orangutan in that nest. A ponderous burden to carry along jungle trails back to camp. To Martin Johnson, it was indeed a memorable experience, leading the tribesmen of Borneo against the wild man of Borneo. And it left an abiding impression on Martin. The forest men against the great forest ape. Now it's the cage for the orang. They're careful with him, for he's far from subdued. Oh, 
Pierce and Moreau, a caged king of the tropical wild. What a magnificent prize for a zoo. In some faraway American city, visitors will gape at him. Children will chatter and marvel at the monster. He'll munch bananas and idle the day long in his den. He'll be in an anthropoid paradise then. But a newly captured orangutan doesn't look that far ahead, doesn't know all about that. And he rages with the dark, unregenerate soul of the jungle. This was Martin Johnson's greatest capture. That somber, scowling face stands for Borneo. The climax and close of a great career. The career of the popular naturalist, Martin Johnson.